10 minutes of that one class, rather than even trying to get a required security course in a program, I think that that would have an incredibly dramatic impact on the consciousness of students that are coming out of that program. And that's where I think, like, that's what's attracted me to, the, to, this, to this idea, to this meme, to this manifesto, is even if it's just that 10 minutes, that, that can change a developer's attitude. So um, there's a number of directions I could take. Um, you guys reminded me of some things I normally say in the non-speedy version. But um, we, we've had some conversations, very valuable conversations the last few days about where does this belong and whose responsibility is it? And, and just like safety, this is everybody's responsibility, right? So uh, oftentimes it's an economic thing. And we had a debate this morning with Marianne before her keynote about is this, are there strong economic disincentives for software developers? to write more secure code. And the, my, one of my conspirators up there, David Rice, he wrote a book called Economics where he basically says it's more expensive to write good code. So the builders of software aren't incented to do so. It's also more expensive to buy more secure code. So the buy side of supply and demand doesn't really demand it. And there's some problems in his arguments and whatnot. But uh, essentially, this isn't simply a matter of a bit flip in the hearts and minds of the developers. It's also going to have to be tipping the economics such that people would vote with their wallets or put language into RFPs. And that's been one of the more promising things I've seen. I know we've talked about this, but if the buyers of software you know, kind of revolt and say, we don't want your software to put my company at risk with a lot of this stuff lately, um, they may start demanding or putting contract language in. So um, I'm curious what the take is on how much of this is an economics thing and how much, you know, it can't simply be a hearts and minds thing, but how much is education, how much is this is students, how much is this existing practitioners, how much of this is the software providers, and how much of this is the buy side? I know it's kind of a loaded question, but how do we fight the multiple fronts of this uh, particular problem? Anybody? I'll go. Um, you definitely can't, you can never extract the economics of it because there's, there's a reality that it costs a certain amount of extra money to do it. Uh, one thing I've seen is that when people start from scratch, you know, then it's expensive in the beginning, but over time they just start incorporating it into what they do. It just becomes part of what they do and the, the you know, nominal additional cost is actually not that much because it's just part of what we do now. Um, so I think over time that curve goes down. Um, it's not, it never goes down to zero, but it definitely goes down. Um, and you know, for kind of factoring in, you know, show people the cost of the, you know, the, the famous study done by IBM of the $1 bug that cost, you know, $6.50 in, in um, if you find it when you're writing code and $15 in QA and $60 in production, like that, that works, you know, because it, it's very clear the more rework you have to do, the more it's going to cost in the long run. It's going to be more expensive once you have the incident. Some of the things that we, we talk about, you know, the remediation costs are so low compared to the cost of one incident. And it blows my mind that, you know, it's, they're not doing that math. And factoring things like the reputation into it. Um, you know, and I do think that it does have to kind of address your other point. I, in a lot of ways, it does have to be addressed by the people buying the software. Uh, some of my you know, larger customers, they absolutely incorporate into their process now and say, we will not buy software that's not secure. Now, it's not perfect because sometimes the line of business that wants the software says, well, we really, really, really want this. And you know, it, can, it, can we just like, let, that, what's, let it slide this one time? You know, at some point, they're, they're starting to say, no, it's not acceptable anymore. And the conversation that I'm hearing from, you know, pushback from the vendors is interesting because vendors who should know better are pushing back and saying, oh, well, it's okay for our other Fortune 500 customers. What's wrong with you? So, you know, at that point, you have to just draw the line somewhere and say, well, tough. You have to follow our, our methodologies and make sure that you've, you know, it, it shouldn't be unreasonable to ask a vendor, show me the result of a pen test of a, of a, from a reputable vendor. That should not be unreasonable at all. And it, I, people are getting pushback on that, especially from vendors that aren't traditionally security vendors. They're like, what's a pen test? You know? anyway, that's enough. Yeah, I, I don't think um, it's that expensive, to tell you the truth, if, like you're saying, to build it in. I mean, the biggest thing, I mean, if you take the example of SQL injection and, and cross-site scripting, it's not that expensive to write an application that doesn't have SQL injection or, or cross-site scripting. It's using different APIs and being, and being aware of them um, and then, of course, you should do some testing to make sure that you don't have that. But um, you know, if you're if you have a product line that's you know you're you're, you're making millions of dollars in revenue to have you know ten thousand dollars of security testing on there, yeah. it's pretty trivial if you think about it. So I, I don't really buy the 
the uh, sometimes the, it's the driven process. by the arrogance of the people lead, designing the systems that they're like, well, my system is secure, or or they, or they think you're full of crap, or you have to show them the vulnerability. And it, but when you actually sh like break it apart and show them how you can really get in, then suddenly they're like, oh, maybe it wasn't so secure after all. You know. And I think it's also partly related to the sort of ghettoization of QA within the software development lifecycle and how that's like outside of security that's so dramatically right. undervalued. And for that reason, it isn't seen as being sort of part of what you need to do in your development lifecycle. Yeah, I always joke with the developing groups. I say, all right, we always have these release dates that don't never slip. And then we always have development de deadlines that always do. And it's like a vice that just crushes QA and QA falls out into the floor. And then I ask the question, was security testing even incorporated in there in the first place? Or was it just QA that fell out? And usually the answer is they didn't think about security at all in the first place. You have a question? It's a pretty broad question. Um, well, hopefully you're lowering costs of you know incident response, product incident response team, um, you know your PR efforts, brand damage, right? So you're you're lowering those, but it is going to be more expensive to build a secure software. I just don't think it's that much more expensive. Um, and uh, you know just you know I I I I have customers that can train their development teams and incorporate security testing in for you know maybe ten thousand twenty thousand dollars you know we're not talking a huge right. amount of amount of money I mean this stuff there's a lot of automated testing tools is online um, online training um, that that isn't that expensive right and make no mistake the the cost of incidents is going to keep going up because you know a lot of companies have been able to mitigate some of their cost by you know having insurance there's only so many times those hits are going to happen before the insurance companies raise the premium so yeah. high that it's just it's negligent to not do it yeah, I, I actually have insurance companies coming to me and asking me what questions should I be asking um, my 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 uh, the people I'm insuring. What what questions should I ask them about? You know, are they looking at security in their acquisition of their IT technology? And um, I, I you know the obvious conclusion there is the rates are going to be higher for people that aren't incorporating any kind of uh, security in their acquisition programs. It, um, one of the one of the hopes out of the rugby community is that um, as we've been doing this, there's always someone that comes up to me later and says, "Oh, this is how I sold security or an SDL to my business. Here was the math math I used. Here was the pie charts I used. I demonstrated it. We got budget. We proved its value. We used vendor X Y Z. So we're kind of hoping to either collect these and make a repository so people can reuse them. It's not an impossible thing. It's just that we don't have the experience and knowledge on how to do it or sell it." So part of the idea here is as we get more participation, which has been the biggest problem, as we get more participation, people will be able to, to share these success stories uh, with each other. Yep. Um, I'm not completely convinced that in the long run, uh, implementing security winds up being more expensive. If you think about the kinds of protection mechanisms that one might implement, such as input validation in all interfaces, right? My suspicion is that that's not only going to fix security bugs, that's going to fix a lot of functional bugs, right? Right. And Secure code is robust is, code. <laughs> if that is the case, then that would be a very strong argument for cost reduction yep. because you're sort of getting, you know, double for the effort. But I don't know of any studies that have actually tried to look at that. I don't know how such studies could be constructed. But that seem, seems to me like one, one area where one could, you know, potentially launch some studies. And if that winds up being true, that could be quoted as often as, you know, how expensive it is to fix the bug in implementation. Right. I mean, we've been saying that for years. I mean, back when we were at AppStick, we, we would write reports. We'd have to go in and convince people that they needed to spend money on the security thing. And that was one of our arguments was that if you build in security, you get robust code as a side benefit. So everybody wins. It's, you're going you're gonna to have less downtime and re less maintenance time in the long run. The Canadian on the panel pointed out there's a Canadian in the back who's been patient. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I just want to say I completely disagree that secure code will cost more money. In fact, insecure code in the long run will cost more money just because uh, I've been in software engineers and the product manager for a software firm, and you know, the initial cost will be more to make secure code. It would increase your, time, your timeline, it would increase your QA cycles, and it would increase your go to market. Targets, but over the long run, you're going to save your money in your support calls, in your sales team, in your QA retesting to try and find the bug, and then in money that you're spending to get 